We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? Is that going to be? During one of the most difficult days in Homs recently, when the Syrian assault on the opposition was especially intense, a person in the beleaguered town was quoted by a newspaper asking for someone, anyone, to help. Where is the United Nations, he asked. That voice and many similar voices is the concern of this woman. Navi Pillay, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Based in Geneva, her mandate is to protect human rights around the world. Her role, a sort of conscience of the international community, often puts her in the crosshairs of politics and morality. A role familiar to Ms. Pillay, who fought against the apartheid regime in her home country, South Africa. It was her recent speech at the United Nations in which she called for action against Syria and implored world leaders to hear the cries of help from Syrians that brought her particular attention. I am outraged by these serious violations. The longer the international community fails to take action, the more the civilian population will suffer from countless atrocities committed against them. Today, Navi Pillay talks to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. The latest report by the Commission of Inquiry on Syria makes for quite grim reading, doesn't it? It talks about the execution of civilians. It talks about the sniping of children, even the torture of patients in hospitals. What does this mean? Does this mean that it's really time for the Security Council to authorize the use of military force in Syria? This is indeed a very important report. The first thing one notices there is they say that the situation has deteriorated. The violence, injury, deaths, uh, displacement of people has deteriorated since their last report. And it's now systematic, it's widespread, it's gross, a lot of strong terms. Yes, and, and of course, from our monitoring, we know that it's in fact much worse than the Commission is reporting, because subsequent to them finalizing their report, there's now the use of heavy weaponry and shelling, and therefore many more uh, deaths and injuries. So what does this mean? I mean, does this mean, would you call upon the Security Council to say, read this and vote in favor of military intervention? Well, I did give a briefing to the Security Council in uh, December last year when the uh, resolution that they had drafted was vetoed. So even then the situation I said was very serious and something had to be done. What is that something though, Ms. Pillay? To us, it's protection of civilians, which is primary, because in 2005, at a world summit, all the world leaders got together and unanimously agreed that it's the responsibility of a state to protect its population from human rights uh, violations and humanitarian violations. And that if that state manifestly fails to carry out that responsibility, then it's the responsibility of the international community as a whole or by individual states to uh, step in to protect civilians. And that is my clear message. Exactly what kind of action is, is a matter for political decision by member states of the Security Council. But let me emphasize that it is only the Security Council that has the power uh, to make legally binding resolutions and decisions. Were you disappointed? Were you outraged at the fact that Russia and China used their veto in the last attempt to try and get the Security Council to issue a resolution? Well, like the Secretary General, I was disappointed that they didn't uh, come up with some kind of collective action, if not that resolution, then some immediate urgent remedy. And, and I look to states then to use their own persuasive powers and their powers to pressure all sides there to end the hostilities. I'm sure you've seen the pictures we've all been seeing, really difficult pictures to watch coming out of Syria, of civilians dying, even of babies dying slowly. 
Do you think it's time, and I know you've spoken about referring Syria to the Security Council and to the ICC before, but it's really difficult to watch these pictures and imagine that the Syrian president is really unaware of what's going on, isn't it? Is it time for the Security Council to personally refer Bashar al-Assad to the ICC, the International Criminal Court? You know, based on my own experience as a judge who served on the International Criminal Court, when I make a statement, it's evidence-based. So based on the evidence that my own um, mission gathered, and then the first report of the commission, it was clear to me that there is evidence of widespread and systematic killings, rape, torture, detentions, and displacement, and that these amounted to crimes against humanity. And as far back as December last year, I called for a referral by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court for investigation. And I still stay by that position, particularly after the most recent commission of inquiry, I understand is going to hand me a list of names whom they uh, say uh, are suspected as perpetrators. Do you expect the president's name to be on that list? Well, I haven't received the list as yet. I want to emphasize that most of the violence emanates from actions by the state and their state security forces, their army. It will just take a single order from the top to stop that violence. So in a sense, you, you may not have received the list yet, but from the information you have and your background, as you mentioned in the ICC, is there reason to suspect that President Bashar al-Assad should be held responsible and accountable by judicial authorities? Based on all the information we've gathered, I would confirm that, that there should be responsibility held at the highest level. And in my view, none of these uh, atrocities would happen uh, without the approval or even the complicity of the authorities. What will you do with that list once you get it? We will refer them to any credible investigation authorities. Including the ICC? Is that a possibility? That is a possibility, yes. When will you make that decision? I'm going to first study the report and the list and first see who is requesting the information and ensure that it's a credible investigatory uh, institution. It could be national or international. It could be the Security Council directing me uh, to act on that list, for instance. What are your feelings on the thoughts, the suggestions that the best way, or one of the possible ways perhaps to protect civilians might be to arm the opposition. Do you think that would be overall a positive development for protecting human rights? I uh, do believe that the uh, bottom line should be uh, for these parties to stop the violence. So any kind of provision of uh, military equipment to the opposition in my view, will escalate the violence and not lead to the goal that we're all trying to achieve. So you don't think it's a good idea, in other words, for countries to be sending arms to the opposition at this point? I think that countries should be focusing their energy on achieving a, a peaceful resolution here and to ensure that the root causes of the conflict are addressed, uh, which is a, a large majority that is excluded uh, from, from government and who suffer enormous human rights violations. It's, there are many root causes of this conflict that needs to be addressed and supplying arms to a few individuals is not going to help that situation. But, but they've tried that, haven't they, Madam Commissioner? I mean, it doesn't seem to be working. As, as I International see, pressure, does it? As I see it, it is not the role of outsiders to arming one or the other group. If we could talk a little bit um, about the situation in Iran. How do you see the human rights situation there? I'm very concerned about the human rights situation in Iran. It's an area from which I receive the largest number of uh, heartbreaking complaints. They particularly relate to uh, suppression of dissent in many forms. 
it's so fundamental that freedom of speech and freedom of assembly has to be respected. And yet it is not in Iran. Many human rights defenders, journalists, and members of the opposition uh, are in custody. I'm very concerned about the treatment of the Baha'i community and some huge sentences that have been passed against some of them. I continue to raise these matters uh, with the government of Iran. And, and of course, I am uh, considering visiting Iran officially at, at their invitation, which has been extended to me. When might you go? We uh, have waited for a pre-mission from my office to go and prepare the visit. They went, uh, Hani Megali headed it, and they came back and both sides, my office and the government, felt the need to have further preparations in place before I go, because the missions I conduct as High Commissioner for Human Rights is that we go uh, where we want to go and see who we want to see. And at the end of it, we make a, a public statement on uh, areas of concern. If we could talk a little bit about the possibility of a military strike on Iran as well. It's something that worries a lot of people around the world, but it's also something that worries activists within Iran. Even those who are struggling against the regime, a large group of them have written separate essays trying to draw attention to the possible negative impact a military strike might have on civil liberties within Iran. If I may read to you here um, a piece which was written by Fakhr Sadat Muhtashi Mapur. She's a jailed female activist of the reformist Islamic Participation Front. She's been in prison since taking part in a protest on March the 1st. And she says, quote, if there is a military strike against Iran, it will certainly create a security state. Using war rhetoric, they try to pressure society and hinder civil society's activities by accusing them of aiding the United States to attack Iran. Do you agree with that? Do you think a military strike on Iran would represent a setback for human rights in the country? Well, that might be a consequence. That might be a possible reaction on the part of the Iranian authorities. My concern is any kind of military strike will have enormous negative impacts on the population, on civilians. They will be caught up in, 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 this, in the strikes wherever they come from and if they returned. And I fear that there will be huge loss of civilian lives and that should be the consideration of anyone contemplating a military strike. Do you express those concerns to representatives of the US and Israel? Let me say that I've yet to see any public declaration made by the United States or Israel. Well, there are some Israeli politicians, particularly Prime Minister Netanyahu has uh, alluded to some such threat. They said everything is on the table, nothing is off the table, which kind of means it's possible that they would conduct a military strike. Do you, do you speak to perhaps members of the Security Council from those countries and say, hang on, you might want to consider the human rights impact of any such strike? I have not done so yet, but we are watching the situation very carefully, and I will make a statement precisely to the effect that I've just said. Remember, civilians will be caught up here. Uh, you, you may have a dispute uh, between governments. You have to worry about saving lives. That that's the bottom line. When it comes to that, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that point. Let's talk a little bit about sanctions on Iran then. Those have been put into place. Uh, more are going to be executed soon. And they're already impacting the lives of ordinary Iranians, aren't they? They're pushing up the prices of basic food, stirring worries about medical supplies, pushing up inflation, unemployment. Aren't they already infringing on the human rights of Iranians? Well, that's important to realize that any kind of measures imposed by the Security Council or other body relating to economic sanctions is going to cause hardship on ordinary people. Is it acceptable, though? It seems to be a, a measure that is often resorted to by states when they've reached a point when words have failed to persuade governments to, 
to protect human rights. It does indeed, but are you happy with that? You are the, the conscious, the human rights conscience of the world as we watch people suffering under those sanctions. Just because states do seem to use it, you're right. Doesn't that bother you? Let me say that I also view this, this from the experience of a victim as a South African under apartheid. Sanctions bit very hard on us individually, but we welcomed a collective action on the part of international community. The worst thing you can feel as a victim if people forget about your suffering and do nothing. But having said that, my voice as High Commissioner for Human Rights is always that sanctions have to be so structured that they do not cause harm to the people whom they're designed to protect. If we could talk a little bit about Bahrain then, and looking at how the police have handled recent demonstrations there, was there an excessive use of force? I have said during the uh, protest that there has been an excessive use of force and uh, torture. The, uh, the Bahraini Independent Commission of Inquiry reached the same conclusion, and I welcome that the king acknowledged. But I'm talking about, Madam um, What's Commissioner, going on now? The, the latest demonstrations in January, for example, the allegations about improper use of police tear gas. Was that excessive? Should there be some accountability for that? That was excessive. There has to be accountability, and I'm very concerned about the treatment of protesters and critics of the government even now. But in Bahrain, we uh, have been invited by the government to send in human rights advisors, principally to ensure the implementation of the recommendation of that commission of inquiry. It made very clear recommendations, and the government promised that they will implement those recommendations. They, and, and I'm also watching the uh, trials, because that was a particular request of mine. The uh, suspects whom they put on trial, particularly the medical people, have to be afforded a proper trial in civilian courts. Um, so we are right now engaged in working out the terms of reference for in our engagement in Bahrain. You've mentioned the Commission of Inquiry in Bahrain, and they did make a lot of recommendations. One of the criticisms, though, is that there hasn't been sufficient accountability high up the chain of command in the security apparatus for violations. Do you share that view? Well, you know, it's, that's why we always urged for, we urge full and comprehensive investigation by an independent body. These commissioners are highly respected. Sharif Bassioni, I think, was very forthright in, in, in making the recommendations. And that's what's open uh, about uh, uh, an inquiry such as this, that people should be able to criticize and critically examine that commission's report. And my office is doing the same. And we may have our own ideas based on information and our own monitoring that people higher up should be investigated, particularly in, in the military and police force here. But Sharif Bassioni told me that one of the immediate um, positive outcomes of that inquiry were that people were released from detention and students who had been denied access to universities were allowed to go back. So there was some immediate benefit of such an investigation. Its shortfalls are matters that I and my office will continue to address and watch out for. What are the shortfalls that you will continue well, to watch out Well, one would for? be that not all the people who were alleged to have been the ones who gave the orders and uh, or took the political decisions uh, that there's culpability and responsibility higher up. This is what the Rome Statute tells us. How high up are we talking? This is why we need a proper investigation because we, we can't just guess someone high up there. You need the trail of evidence. You have to track that evidence. 
uh, it is possible to investigate those because... But didn't we have, Madam Commissioner, an investigation, an inquiry already? I mean, did they fail to, to follow the trail high enough? I don't know what obstacles they faced or whether they voluntarily uh, limited their inquiries, what their mandate was. I'm just saying it's a good start to ha to, for a government to get outsiders to do an investigation, but it's only a start. It's open for all of us to uh, demand follow-ups to that. Well, you call for the release of Abdul Hadi Khawaja. He's president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. He's one of the people that protesters are calling for to be released. Would you call for his release? I would, and continually stress the importance of respect for the right to protest, which falls under freedom of expression. And the king himself has assured me that he respects civil and political rights in Bahrain and will continue to do so. We've also got elections coming up in Russia soon. Given the claims of irregularities in December's parliamentary poll. How optimistic are you that the process in March for presidential elections in Russia is going to be more orderly, and that they have learnt perhaps from some of the alleged mistakes which were made? I have urged Russia to respect the right of peaceful protests, to respect and encourage uh, differing opinions uh, and this is part of the criteria for free and fair elections, that people must be able to express their opinion. And elections must be so structured that there is full participation by all. Do you think they're, they're learning that? Are they listening to you? Do you think they're taking to heart what you're urging them to do? Well, I hope so. It's a huge country. I've met different ministers. They, they, they all don't think alike. I had a very good meeting with uh, President Medvedev and he himself was embarking on a reform process. So while I'm in no position to predict the outcome of these elections, we do urge all the essentials to make it a free and fair process and above all stress that in Russia there really needs to be greater consultation uh, with the people. And this is something I will continue to urge when Russia comes before the Human Rights Council for their universal periodic review, because that is one of the recommendations made to Russia by other states. I may say, Madam Commissioner, you have a very difficult mandate, don't you? You have a very difficult job to come in every day and, and look at human rights violations around the world. Does it ever just get simply too much, too depressing? I, I, I think of all those human rights defenders out there, journalists included, who are daily in the front lines taking huge risks. They face detention, torture, and even death as they do their work to highlight violations all over the world. And these are our natural partners, so are civil society organizations. Does that keep you going, in a sense, their determination? It does. I think that this is a very important mandate created by all the states of the world. Uh, it, it's, it's governments that created the mandate. They wanted the one voice to speak in terms of the principles at, and standards that they themselves set for themselves. Do you think your background and what you personally lived through since your childhood in South Africa, apartheid, do you think that's prepared you for this role? I think that um, if you bring in life experiences, it enhances uh, your understanding and sensitivity of other people's suffering. But what the experience in South Africa taught me is never to give up hope, because that was 300 years of apartheid. I never thought there would be change in my lifetime. And we, it was a closed society, and what inspired us inside is the level of support outside. If anyone made a statement outside condemning the government's practice of apartheid, it inspired us to struggle further for our rights. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Navi Pillay, thanks so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.